Some can gaze and not be sick, but I could never learn the trick. There's this to say for blood and breath. They give a man a taste for death. John, Adam Dalgleish. Sir? Well, the Commissioner's had a word with the Home Office. This one's ours. Ours? But the new squad isn't officially up and running till Monday week. I know, but a government minister with his throat cut. That's exactly the sort of high-profile case we're meant for. We are being commissioned early. Government minister? I thought he'd resigned. Ex-minister then, perhaps even ex-MP. It's still ours. I take it to vision assure the body really is Sir Paul Barone. One of the bodies, John. Don't forget the tramp. Yes, it's Barone, all right. The parish priest knew him. Apparently it wasn't the first time Barone had spent the night in his church vestry. Incidentally, you'd better alert Inspector Miskin. Oh, Kate's off today, sir. I'll get her at her flat, and I'll rally the rest of the team. Fine, I'll meet you outside. Fifteen minutes. You knew him, sir, didn't you? Uh, Barone, I mean. I liked him. When did you last see him? A couple of weeks ago. He asked me to call on him in the department. I could never see Paul Barone without being reminded of the portrait of his ancestor, Sir Hugo, in the National Portrait Gallery. The likeness was almost uncanny. The same long-boned face, high cheekbones, widely spaced eyes, the same steady but slightly ironic gaze. Read that, he said, and handed across a sheet of paper. The printed message didn't beat about the bush. Women should beware of the transport minister. His first wife was killed in a car accident he was driving. Teresa Nolan, who nursed his mother, killed herself after an abortion. The naked body of Diana Travers, his domestic, was found drowned at his wife's Thameside birthday party. Three deaths. Proximity to the elegant baronet can be lethal. I looked at him. Any idea who could have sent this? None. But it's close to an accusation of murder. It's actionable. I handed it back. Has this been sent to anyone else? Sir Paul opened his desk drawer. At least one journal's had it. This is the current edition of the Paternoster Review. The magazine had been running a series of articles on members of the government. It was Sir Paul Barone's turn. It started innocuously enough... His successful political career and how he lived with his second wife in the family home shared with his mother, Lady Ursula. It spoke of his daughter by his first marriage, Sarah Barone, who was active in left-wing politics. But when it turned to his second marriage, it became unpleasantly snide. His elder brother, Major Sir Hugo Barone, had been killed in Northern Ireland. Shortly afterwards, Paul's wife died in a car accident, and within five months, Paul had married his brother's fiancée, finding consolation, as the paper put it, in the beautiful, bereaved Barbara. But the real sting lay in the final paragraph, its origin unmistakable. Women close to him have been singularly unlucky. His first wife died in a car smash while he was driving. Teresa Nolan, a young nurse caring for his mother, killed herself after an abortion, and four weeks ago a young girl who worked for him, Diana Travers, was found drowned following a party he threw to mark his wife's birthday. "'They're wrong about that, you know,' he said. "'I didn't arrange that birthday party. Barbara did. And in the end I couldn't make it. I wasn't there. Do you know what happened?' "'I gather that Dominic Swain, that's Barbara's brother, wasn't invited.' So, in a fit of pique, he threw his own party and included Diana Travers among the guests. Then some of them went for a midnight swim, and Diana drowned. I looked across at him. What do you want me to do? Barone smiled. Do you know, I'm not exactly sure. Keep a watching brief, I suppose. Do you think all this scandal could have led to his suicide? What suicide? All we've got at the moment are two corpses lying in a church vestry with their respective throats cut. One of them, Sir Paul Barone, the other, a nameless tramp. Well, nameless at the moment. Come on, let's make a start. I wasn't surprised that Kate Miskin had beaten us to the scene. Bodies are through here, sir. They call it the Little Vestry. The Little Vestry was garishly lit. 
and the whole bizarre scene looked unreal. Barone's sprawled body and severed throat, the clotted blood, the tramp, propped like a marionette against the wall. The bodies, Kate told me, had been found by an unlikely pair of companions. Sixty-five-year-old Miss Emily Wharton, a regular churchgoer, and ten-year-old Darren Wilkes. Theirs was a strange friendship. Some months before, Darren had attached himself to Miss Wharton, and now they met regularly every Wednesday and Friday when she came to replace dead flowers in the vase before the Statue of the Virgin. It was 8.45 on the morning of Wednesday, the 18th of September, when the two of them approached the south door, the one to which Miss Wharton had the key. But to her surprise, she found the heavy iron-bound door unlocked. Kate said that as Miss Wharton felt for the light switch, Darren scampered past her. He liked to light a candle when they arrived, thrusting his thin arm through the grill that separated the passage from the church nave so as to reach the candle holder and the coin box. Early in their walk, she'd given him the usual ten-p piece, and she heard the faint tinkle as it fell into the box. Now a faint smell, alien yet horribly familiar, came to her nostrils, and suddenly she knew that something was dreadfully wrong. Gently at first, and then with one sudden movement, she opened the door to the little vestry, and she saw the horror itself. Two bodies lay like butchered animals in a waste of blood, their throats cut. She sent Darren to fetch Father Barnes. Five minutes later the priest arrived. He stood staring at the scene. "'Do you know them, Father?' "'Oh, yes, yes, the tramp, that's Harry Mack. Poor Harry sleeps in the porch sometimes. And the other?' "'The other is Sir Paul Barone, M.P., until a few days ago a government minister.' "'Well, Kate?' "'Murder followed by suicide, I'd say.' Harry Mack has one clean slash. Barone shows the classic pattern of self-inflicted wounds. Three cuts, two tentative, the third severing the trachea. Seems obvious. Yes, perhaps too obvious. Look at that blanket. Barone must have clutched at it as he fell. It's half dragged off the bed, all bunched up on his right side. What of it? Look, look at the razor. It's lying on top of it, just by his right hand. He couldn't have dragged the blanket while holding the razor. No. He'd have dropped the razor first. So why should it be lying on top of the blanket? While waiting for the team to arrive, John Massingham and I pulled on latex gloves and took a look round the little vestry. What we found confirmed my growing conviction that this was a murder scene. In the grate lay a partially burned diary. Among the fragments of blackened paper lay a used match, but the box it came from was nowhere to be found. On the ancient oak desk lay a pink blotter that seemed almost as old as the desk itself, but superimposed on the faded markings were blottings that were clearly very recent. I went over to Barone's jacket. Inside was an elegantly slim fountain pen. It should be possible for the lab to match the ink with that on the blotting paper. But if Barone had been writing, where was the paper now? Had he himself disposed of it? Or had someone else found it, perhaps even come specifically in order to find it? Lastly, Massingham and I went through into the kitchen. A tea towel hung by the sink. I peeled off my gloves and felt it. Damp all over. As if it had been soaked, wrung out, and left to dry. Well, the murderer would have had to have washed his hands and arms. Above the sink was a simple glass shelf. On it lay a sponge bag. With my gloves back on, I opened it. Inside was a narrow leather case with the initials PSB stamped in faded gold. I lifted the lid and found what I'd expected. The twin to the cutthroat razor lying so incriminatingly close to Barone's right hand. I thought these went out with Sweeney Todd. Who on earth uses them these days? Darren was still waiting in the police car. He looked up at me with bright, suspicious eyes. She never did it, Miss Wharton. She's innocent. We never thought she did. That's all right, then, he said. It's lucky you were together when you found the bodies, I said. Turned her up proper, said Darren. She don't like blood. I went to fetch Father Barnes. John, I want you to go home with Darren. There's something that boy's keeping back. See if you can get to the bottom of it. 
That's it. Father Barnes was sitting bolt upright, staring at the gleaming curve of the apse. When did you first meet Sir Paul Barone? Last Monday, just over a week ago. He called at the vicarage and asked if he could see the church. We keep it locked, you see. He said he'd always wanted to see St. Matthew's. So you gave him the key? Well, he was away for about an hour. When he came back, he said he'd like to sleep that night in the little vestry. He'd noticed the bed. It was an odd request. Did he give any reason? No. He made it sound quite ordinary. So at about eight o'clock that evening he turned up carrying a hold all, and I gave him the key. The following morning I went to the little vestry. The bed had been made up. Everything was very tidy. So I went into the church, and he was sitting in this row a little further along. There were just the two of us. He took communion. Afterwards we walked together to the little vestry, and he left. And that was all on this first visit? Not quite. When I placed the wafer in his hands... Yes? I thought I saw... There were marks, wounds, on his wrists. Stigmata. Evidence of an intense religious experience. Have you told anyone else about this? Only you. Then please don't. Only imagine the effect if this were to become public. It isn't even necessary to refer to it in your statement. If you need to confide in anyone, tell your bishop. During the following week, Barone resigned from the government and announced his intention of leaving the Commons as well. Yesterday morning, he'd rung Father Barnes, asked to spend the night in the church again, and arranged to pick up the key at six o'clock that evening. He'd arrived promptly, carrying the same hold all. The next thing I knew was when young Darren came for me and told me there were two dead bodies in the little vestry. I asked him to tell me about Harry Mack. Poor Harry was a problem for St. Matthew's. For some reason, he'd taken to sleepy in the south porch, bedded down on newspapers and covered with an old blanket. Perhaps, said Father Barnes, He'd already settled down under his blanket when Barone arrived, and Barone had asked him in out of the cold to share his meal. I asked Father Barnes if he'd told anyone that Sir Paul was spending the night in the church. Oh, no. There was no one to tell. No one knew anything about him. Not until this morning. Ah, Inspector Miskin. Kate, I want you to break the news to Sir Paul's family. Yes, sir. There's a wife and an elderly mother, Lady Ursula, oh, and a housekeeper of sorts. Take it easy with you. When the news breaks, they may need protection. of Paul's death brought back to me the moment I first heard that Hugo had been killed in Northern Ireland. So to my present grief was added a grief for Hugo, as keen, as new as when I'd first heard of his death. I suddenly developed a raging thirst. Matty brewed me pot after pot of strong coffee which I gulped down scalding hot. After a while, the physical symptoms subsided. You're sure, Lady Ursula? Uh, Here, let me... Stop fussing, Maddie. I'm perfectly all right now. Please leave me alone. Yes, go away. Oh, and bring Mr. Lampart up to me as soon as he arrives. Of course, Lady Ursula. I sat thinking, there is a world outside this pain. I shall take hold of it again. I must survive. Seven years, ten at the most, that's all I need. So I must husband my strength. 
This meeting with Stephen. There are things I have to say, and there might not be much time. Mr. Lampard, my lady. Ah, oh, Stephen. Oh, please ah. don't stand up, Lady Ursula. You, you mustn't. You're due for a hip replacement, aren't you? I'm on the waiting list. Ah, forgive me, but aren't you suffering unnecessarily? Why not go private? I'm not in favour of buying privilege. I prefer to be treated on the National Health Service. But I haven't called you here for a professional opinion. <laughs> Which, as an obstetrician, I wouldn't in any case be competent to give. <laughs> Lady Ursula, this news about Paul is horrifying. Unbelievable. Shouldn't you have sent for your own doctor or a friend? You should have someone with you at a time like this. I have Matty. At 82, the few people one might wish to see are all dead. And I've outlived both my sons. That's the worst thing that can happen to a human being. I have to endure it, but I don't have to talk about it. I could have added, least of all with you... It seemed to me that the words unspoken hung between us. Underneath his pattern of professional success, I thought Stephen Lampart ambitious and a little vulgar. But this was prejudice, and prejudice is dangerous. After all, Stephen had been Hugo's best friend at Oxford. I knew I must be careful to betray as little as possible if this interview were to go the way I wanted. Stephen, there are two things we have to discuss, and there may not be another opportunity. Of course, Lady Ursula. Paul was murdered. The police will know that soon if they don't already. Forgive me, but can you be sure? All Barbara could tell me when she rang this morning was that the police had found Paul's body and that of a tramp, and that there were... Injuries to their throats. Their throats had been cut, both of them. And from the careful tact with which the news was broken to me, I imagine that the weapon was one of Paul's open razors. I suppose Paul was capable of killing himself. Most of us are given sufficient pain. But he most certainly was not capable of killing that tramp. No, my son was murdered. And that means there are certain facts the police will make it their business to discover. What facts, Lady Ursula? That you and my daughter-in-law are lovers. I see. Who told you that? Paul or Barbara? Neither. But I've lived in the same house with Barbara for four years. I may be crippled, but I have the use of my eyes and my intelligence. How is Barbara? How's she taking all this? I don't know. She's apparently too distressed to talk to visitors. Seems that I count as a visitor. Is that quite fair? Paul was her husband, and she did care for him. Perhaps more than either of us understand. Look, d do we have to talk now? We're both of us in shock. Yes, we have to talk, and there isn't much time. The policewoman who broke the news to me said that Commander Dalgleish is coming here as soon as they've finished with whatever they're doing at the church. Presumably he'll want to interview Barbara as well. In time, he'll get round to you. I have to know what it is you propose to tell them. This Dalgleish, isn't he some kind of a poet? An odd hobby for a policeman? If he's as good a detective as he is a poet, he's a dangerous man dangerous. I've no reason to fear the police. You aren't seriously suggesting that they'll suspect me of cutting Paul's throat because I go to bed with his wife? I'm not saying they'll suspect you, Stephen, but it will cause less trouble if neither of you lies about your relationship. I'd prefer not to have to lie about it myself. Naturally, I shan't volunteer information, but it is possible they'll ask. But why on earth should they do that, Lady Ursula? Because my son was a minister of the crown. 
and Commander Dalgleish will liaise with special branch. Do you suppose there's anything about a minister's private life which isn't known to these people? Of course. I should have thought of that. I don't think my mind is working properly yet. Then I suggest that it begins working. You and Barbara have to agree on your story. Better still, agree to tell the truth. I take it Barbara was your mistress when you first introduced her to Hugo and that she remained your mistress after Hugo was killed and she married Paul. Believe me, Lady Ursula, none of that was intended. It just happened. There's something you must understand. I may be her lover, but she doesn't love me. She'd never get rid of a perfectly good husband and a title to marry me, and certainly not by murder. You have to believe that. If you and she are going to go on living together... That at least was frank. You seem well suited to each other. Yes. We suit each other. She feels safe with me. That's why I suspect she doesn't feel particularly guilty. It's difficult to take adultery seriously when there's a marked lack of illicit pleasure. Your role in this relationship can hardly be satisfying. I admire your self-sacrifice. <laughs> oh, but she's so beautiful. And you see, Barbara adores attention. That's one thing you have to admit about sex. If nothing else, it's a guarantee of intense personal attention. But it ends there. No... If she thought I had a hand in killing Paul, she'd never forgive me. And she certainly wouldn't protect me. Who would she protect? Her brother, possibly. But not for long. She and Dominic have never been particularly close. Fortunately, no sibling loyalty will be demanded of her. Dominic Swain was here in this house with Matty for the whole of yesterday evening. Is that his story or hers? Are you accusing Dominic of having a hand in my son's death? Of course not. The idea's ridiculous. And if Matty says he was with her, I've no doubt he was. We all know that Matty is a model of rectitude. You said there were two things we needed to discuss. Yes. I'd like to be sure that the child Barbara is carrying is my grandchild, not your bastard. I see. Well... There's no possible doubt about that. I had a vasectomy three years ago. So, rest assured, you don't really need a DNA test after he's born. He? Oh, yes. It's a boy. Barbara had an amniocentesis. Paul wanted an heir, and he's going to get an heir. Did Paul know about the child before he died? Barbara hasn't said. I imagine not. After all, she's only just heard about the sex of the child herself. I rang and told her first thing yesterday morning. And now, if uh, you'll excuse me, I'll go down and see her before the police descend on her. She's alone, I take it? As far as I know. I've sent for Anthony Farrell, but he has to get up from Winchester. The family lawyer? Won't that look suspicious, having him here? He's a family friend as well as a lawyer. But I'm glad you're seeing her before he arrives. Tell her to answer Dalgleish's questions, but not to volunteer information. Too much candor looks as suspicious as too little. Oh, and um, tell her to say nothing about the child. That's important. If it's what you want. But it could be helpful to mention the pregnancy. She's not to mention it. If you're sure. In that case, I'll uh, go down to Barbara. One more thing. What do you know about Theresa Nolan? No more than you, I imagine. Probably less. She only worked at Pembroke Lodge for four weeks, and I hardly set eyes on her. She nursed you and lived in this house for over six. When she came to me, she was already pregnant. And Diana Travers? Nothing, except that she was unwise enough to overeat, drink too much, and then dive into the Thames. As you must know, Barbara and I had left the Black Swan before she drowned. <laughs> Lady Ursula, 
I really don't think we should be complicating Paul's death with old, irrelevant tragedies. Are they both irrelevant? Incidentally, has Sarah been told? Not yet. Would you like me to go round? She is Paul's daughter, after all. This will be a terrible shock to her. She oughtn't to learn it from the police or through the media. She won't. If necessary, I'll go round myself. But who will drive you? Isn't Wednesday Halliwell's day off? There are taxis. After leaving the church, I went briefly back to the yard to pick up my files on Theresa Nolan and Diana Travers, and it was after midday that I arrived at the Barone family residence in Campton Hill Square. I'd left John Massingham to supervise what remained to be done at the church, and I'd brought Kate with me. It seemed more appropriate there were only women in the house, and it had been Kate who'd first broken the news to Lady Ursula. When I rang the doorbell, it was a full two minutes before the door was opened, and we faced a woman who I knew must be Evelyn Matlock. She was, I guessed, in her late thirties and uncompromisingly plain. A small, sharp nose, a primly censorious mouth, a receding chin. As she stood aside to let us enter, I remembered what Paul Barone had once told me about her. Here was a woman whose father he had unsuccessfully defended, to whom he'd given a home and a job who was supposed to be devoted to him. If that were true, she was concealing her grief at his death with remarkable stoicism. I was accustomed to seeing apprehension, dislike, even hatred. But now, for a moment, what I saw in her eyes was naked fear. It passed almost at once and gave place to what seemed to me an assumed indifference, but it had been there. Commander Dalgleish and Detective Inspector Miskin are here, Lady Ursula. Without waiting for us to step into the room, she turned and left. We stood facing Lady Ursula Barone. Lady Ursula Barone was sitting very upright, her back to the window. She didn't rise as we came in, but held out a hand as Kate introduced me. Please, sit down. If uh, Inspector Miskin has to make notes, she may find that chair by the window convenient. Perhaps you will sit opposite me, Commander. As I sat where she indicated, I saw that her chair was specially designed for the disabled. A control in the armrest raised the seat to help her stand. Its functional modernity struck a discordant note in a room otherwise cluttered with 18th-century furniture. Another modern feature was the paperback lying on the round table to her right. I saw that it was Philip Larkin's required writing. She held it up. Mr. Larkin was a librarian as well as a poet. <laughs> Unusual, perhaps, but not wholly inappropriate. To be a poet and a policeman seems to me eccentric, even perverse. Do you see the poetry harming the detection, or the detection harming the poetry? Well, it's the poetry, I assume, that must suffer. One could scarcely settle down to writing poetry in the middle of a case. <laughs> so far, I've never felt the need to do so. Perhaps the human mind can deal with only one intense experience at a time. You must excuse me. Being interrogated by a detective is a new experience. May I say that Inspector Miskin broke the news to me with tact and consideration. But all she told me was that my son was dead and that there were certain wounds. I've made assumptions about his death, Commander, but would you tell me precisely what happened? His throat was cut. As I thought. The tramp with him, Harry Mack, died the same way. And the weapon? A blood-stained open razor was close to your son's right hand. The razor was his. Yes. I understand that the door to the church, the, the vestry or wherever he was, was open? Yes. Miss Wharton, who discovered the bodies together with the young boy, says she found it unlocked. And are you treating this as suicide? Oh, no. 
I'm treating it as double murder. The tramp Harry Mack didn't kill himself. I don't think your son did either. But it's too early to say more. We must wait for the post-mortems and the forensic tests. Now, there are some questions I need to ask. When did you last see Sir Paul? At eight o'clock yesterday morning. He always brought me my breakfast tray. No doubt he wished to reassure himself that I had survived the night. Did he tell you then, or at any time, that he intended returning to St Matthew's? No. We didn't discuss his plans for the day, only mine. Did any other members of the household know that Sir Paul intended revisiting St Matthew's yesterday evening? I don't know, but I think it unlikely. We have only a small staff. Evelyn Matlock, whom you've met, is the housekeeper. Then there's Gordon Halliwell. He's an ex-sergeant in the guards, and he served with my elder son, Hugo. I suppose he'd call himself a chauffeur handyman. He came here just over five years ago, before Hugo was killed, and stayed on. He has a flat over the garage. He drove Sir Paul? Rarely. Before he resigned, Paul used his ministerial car or drove himself. No, Halliwell drives me. He takes me out almost daily. Sometimes he drives my daughter-in-law. But you'll have to wait to speak to him. Today's his day off. Any other staff? Only one. Mrs Iris Minns. She comes here four days a week to do general housework. Miss Matlock can give you her address. This religious experience of your son's in the vestry of St Matthew's, did he talk to you about no, it? No, he wouldn't have expected me to sympathise. I'm not a religious woman. His alleged experience in that church is inexplicable, and he didn't try to explain it. Not to me, anyway. In the last few seconds, she had been overcome with exhaustion, and her gnarled hands began very gently to shake. But I controlled my compassion as she was controlling her grief. I took from my case the half-burnt diary, still in its protective transparent wrapping. Would you please take a look at this, Lady Ursula? I'd like you to confirm that this diary is in fact Sir Paul's. Please don't unwrap it. Yes, this is his. But it's simply a record of engagements. It can't be of any importance. Then why should he or anyone else wish to burn it? And there's another oddity. The top half of the last page has been torn away. It shows the calendar for last year and this. Can you recall what else, if anything, was on that page? I can't remember that I ever saw that page. When and where did you last see the diary? I'm afraid that's the kind of detail it's impossible for me to remember. There's really only one more matter. Is there anything you can tell me about the two young women who died after they'd been working in this house? Teresa Nolan and Diana Travers? Very little, I'm afraid. Teresa Nolan was a gentle, considerate nurse who helped me over a bad attack of sciatica for about six weeks. She had a room in this house, but she was on duty only at night. When she left, she took a post in a maternity nursing home in Hampstead. And she became pregnant while working here? Probably. But I can assure you that no one in this house was responsible. And Diana Travers? I know even less about her. She was an unemployed actress doing domestic work while resting. I think that's the euphemism they use. Miss Matlock took her on to replace a cleaning woman who'd left. You know why I am asking about these two women? Of course. One or two of my friends made it their business to send me the cutting about my son from the Paternoster Review. I'm surprised that the police should trouble themselves with what is surely no more than cheap journalistic spite. Now, if that is all, Commander, perhaps you would like to see my daughter-in-law. She insisted on escorting Kate and me down to the drawing room two floors below. Here, Sir Paul's widow, Barbara, was waiting to receive us, her lawyer, Anthony Farrell, at her side. Lady Ursula briefly introduced us and left. Lady Barone, when did you last see your husband? Not after 9.15 yesterday morning. I left for a hair appointment about half past ten. Then I did some shopping and had lunch in Knightsbridge. I came back in the middle of the afternoon, changed and took a taxi to Pembroke Lodge. 
That's my cousin's nursing home in Hampstead. He's an obstetrician, Mr. Stephen Lampart. He drove me to dinner at the Black Swan in Cookham, and I was with him till midnight. That's when he brought me home. When you saw Sir Paul that morning, did he tell you how he proposed spending the day? No. But couldn't you look in his diary? He keeps it in his desk drawer in the study. We found the diary, or what remained of it, in the vestry with the two bodies. Good God! It was mutilated and someone had tried to burn it, so we need to find out what he was doing some other way. I'd hoped you could help. But does it matter? I mean, how does it help to know that he went to the estate agent a few hours before he was killed? Did he? He said he had an appointment. Did you say which one? No, and I didn't ask. I suppose God told him to sell the house. I don't think he told him which estate agent to use. It was at this point that Anthony Farrell intervened. He told me that he himself had been expecting to see Sir Paul the previous afternoon. Sir Paul had wanted to discuss certain financial arrangements following his decision to give up his parliamentary career, but he'd rung in the morning to rearrange the meeting for today. Now, as the family solicitor, Farrell said that once it was proved that Sir Paul had been murdered, he'd have to proceed to settle his affairs. But what is there to settle? Paul left everything to me. He told me so. The house too. It's quite straightforward. I'm his widow. It's all mine. And the house alone, I thought, must be worth millions. I recalled, as I so often did, the words of an old detective sergeant when I'd been a newly appointed D.C. Love, lust, loathing, lucre, the four L's of murder, and the greatest of these is lucre. At that moment, the door burst open, and a young man flung himself across the room. Barbie, darling, Matty rang me with the news. It's awful, unbelievable. Darling, how are you? Are you all right? May I introduce my brother, Dominic? Dominic Swain, Commander Dalgleish. Short and broad-shouldered, he had nothing of his sister's classical beauty. Nor, despite his expensive Italian jacket and handmade brogues, did he convey her impression of effortless elegance. What happened, Barbie? Who did it? Do you know? He's acting. I thought this isn't genuine. But then I had second thoughts. Shock and grief affect people in odd ways. But I didn't miss Barbara Brown's small shudder as his arms went round her shoulders. Shock, or mild revulsion. I turned to him. As you are here, Mr. Swain, perhaps you'd answer one or two questions. When did you last see Sir Paul? Oh, do you know? Can't remember. Not for some weeks, anyway. Actually, I was in the house all yesterday evening, but Evelyn, Miss Matlock, wasn't expecting him back for dinner. She said he'd left in the morning, and no one knew where he'd gone. When did you arrive? Just before seven. Stayed till just after ten thirty, then went over to the local pub, the Raj, for a last drink. They remember me there. I was one of the last to leave. And you were here the whole time. Yes. Could Sir Paul have returned to the house while you were here? I suppose so. It doesn't seem likely. I was having a bath for about an hour. That's mainly why I came. He might have come back then. I think Miss Matlock would have mentioned it. I'm sharing digs at the moment. There's only a shower, and that's in the loo. So I've taken to turning up here for the occasional bath and a meal. Our last interview that afternoon at Camden Hill Square was with Miss Matlock. She showed us where Sir Paul kept his diary, but couldn't explain how it came to be found in the vestry of St Matthew's. She said that the previous morning Sir Paul had prepared a picnic lunch for himself in the kitchen before leaving at about ten o'clock. She hadn't known he was going to St Matthew's Church, and she hadn't seen him since. She said that Sarah, Sir Paul's daughter, had called her in the afternoon to see her grandmother, but that Lady Ursula had been out. She confirmed Dominic Swain's account of how he'd spent the previous evening. As we were being driven back to the yard, I rang John Massingham. This lad, Darren Wilkes. Did you find out anything about him, John? I took him home, as you said, sir. My God, what a place of right shambles! His mother was flat out on the bed, drink or drugs or both. I couldn't get a word out of her. The boy's clearly been stealing, left, right, and centre. His room was piled high with all sorts. A lot of it food. Can't blame him, poor mite. What did you do? Rang the juvenile bureau. The lad was terrified they'd put him in a home. Why can't I go home with Miss Wharton? He kept saying, but I. I told him all they'd do was send someone round to look after him. A PC arrived after a bit. She'll stay till his mother can take over. Good. Now, any news of Barone's daughter? Sarah. 
Uh, yes, sir. She's a professional photographer. Pretty busy until tomorrow evening. I've arranged for us to go round at 6.30. It's Sarah. Thank God I've reached you. Ivor, I have to see you. You've heard? Just now on the six o'clock news. Have the police been in touch with you? They've been trying to get me, but I told them I was tied up until tomorrow evening. And are you? Not exactly. How many times have I told you? Never lie to the police unless you're sure they can't find out. They've only got to check your diary. But I couldn't let them come until we'd spoken. There are things they might ask about Teresa Nolan, about Diana... Ivor, we have to meet. Go to the flat. I'll be round shortly. Uh, and don't worry. I'll be with you tomorrow when the police come. Oh, and Sarah. Yes. Yes, I'm here. We were together the whole of yesterday evening. From six o'clock when I arrived from work. We ate in the flat. We stayed together all night. Get that into your mind. Start concentrating on it now. We were together the whole time. Got it? I'll be with you in half an hour. It was just before ten, and John Massingham and I were thinking of locking up our papers for the night when Lady Ursula rang. I apologise for telephoning so late, Commander, but Halliwell has returned home, and I should be grateful if the police could see him now. Tomorrow will be a busy day for both of us, and I'm not sure when he could be available. The door was opened by a resentful Miss Matlock in a long, flowered dressing gown. We followed her through the house and out to the cobbled yard that led to two large garages. The doors of the left-hand one were open, and in the glare of the fluorescent lights we could see a black Vauxhall and a white VW parked neatly side by side, with room for a third car. The entrance to Halliwell's flat was by way of an iron staircase leading up the side of the garage wall. A man's bicycle was propped against it. Miss Matlock left us, and we were making our way down the side of the Vauxhall when the door above opened, and Gordon Halliwell was silhouetted against the light, broad-shouldered and stocky. He invited us in, and we accepted his offer of coffee. He told us he knew that Sir Paul used a cutthroat razor, and that the diary was kept in the top right-hand drawer of Sir Paul's desk. But he couldn't remember when he'd last seen the razors or the diary. He hadn't been told that Sir Paul would be visiting the church the previous evening. He himself had been in the flat from 5.40 until just after 10, when he'd left to visit the widow of one of his comrades killed in action. He told us that Lady Ursula had phoned twice during the evening, once at about 8 to discuss arrangements for the coming week, and again about 9.15 to remind him that he could use the Vauxhall that evening, because his own car was in for servicing. Is there... Any chance that someone from the house or from outside could have taken out a car without your knowing? Halliwell asserted that it would have been impossible. He'd have heard the garage being unlocked. To be absolutely clear, I said, last night from 5.40 until you left for the country shortly after 10, you were here alone in the flat and the garage door was bolted. We'd have to check that country visit of his, I was thinking when suddenly we heard someone coming through the garage. A moment later, the door was flung open, and Dominic Swain stood in the entrance. Oh, my God! Sorry! Sorry! I am always bursting in when the police are doing their stuff. It only came about borrowing the VW tomorrow. Don't worry, Mr Swain, we're just leaving. But as we're here, perhaps we could ask you about one or two matters? In the main house, do you think? Just to confirm, sir... You were here in the house the whole of last evening from the time you arrived, just before seven, till you left for the Raj at 10.30. That's right, Inspector. Clever of you to remember. Look, I admit I'm hardly everyone's favourite brother-in-law, but I had nothing to do with Paul's death. Actually, I don't see why Paul resented me so much. I admit I bath and eat at his expense occasionally. He's hardly on the breadline. And an occasional game of Scrabble with poor Evelyn can't have bothered him but I didn't slit his throat for him. I'm not in the least bloodthirsty. I'm not like Halliwell, trained to creep about among the rocks with my face blackened and a knife between my teeth. 
That's not my idea of amusement. You prefer an evening's scrabble with your lady friend. Who won? Oh, Evelyn. She usually does. 382 points to my 200. If she weren't so depressingly honest, I'd suspect her of cheating. Anyway, you wanted to ask me something, Commander? Tell us about Diana Travers. What about her? She's dead. We know that. She died after a dinner party given by you at the Black Swan. Tell us about it. Why did you invite her? Call it a generous impulse. I knew my dear sister was having what she described as an intimate dinner party at the Black Swan for her birthday. Too intimate to invite me, apparently. So I thought I'd organise a little celebration of my own. Diana happened to be around, so I asked her to join us. What happened after the meal? We went out to the river bank, found this punt moored upstream. The rest of them thought it would be fun to mess about on the river. Diana and I decided to have our fun on the bank. Afterwards, we thought we'd swim out to the punt and bob up beside them. Having first taken off your clothes? They were already off. Sorry if I shock you, Inspector. You dived in first? Waded in. Then I'd struck out and reached the punt. I looked back for Diana, but I couldn't see her. So I struck back for the bank. She wasn't there, but her clothes were. It was then I became scared. And then the body surfaced right by the punt. They struck it with the punt pole. So they held her head above water and paddled to the bank. I helped drag her out. She just lay there, eyes staring. We tried mouth to mouth for a bit, and one of the girls ran to the restaurant for help. No good. End of Diana. End of a jolly evening. Did you know much about her? Tell you one thing I found out. She wasn't an actress. She told me on the way to the Black Swan, no equity card, no drama school. Did she say what her job really was? She said she was working her way through a creative writing course. She was gathering material. And no one asks why you want a temporary job when you say you're on the stage. I can't say I cared one way or the other. Kate, past your bedtime, isn't it? Where are you? Back in the office, sir. I wanted to tell you, I've spoken to the pair who look after Father Barnes, Mr and Mrs McBride, sort of housekeeper and handyman. They both swear that when they passed St Matthew's last night on the way to the pub, it was just after eight, water was fairly gushing out of the drain pipe. Mrs McBride remembers saying to her husband, that's Father Barnes having a strip wash in the vestry. Excellent, Kate. I reckon that more or less pinpoints the time of the murders. We know the murderer had a lot of blood to wash off. Look, John and I aren't coming back. Let's call it a day. It was after 11.30 when I clanged the lift door behind me and turned the key in the security lock of my flat. It was the only place I'd ever thought of as home. My mother had died three days after I was born, and if my gran, who brought me up, knew who my father was, she never told me. Miskin was my mother's name, and my gran's. It had taken a long time, but finally I'd escaped from my grandmother, from the dirty, noisy estate, the graffiti, the broken lifts, the stink of urine. This flat, on the top floor of Victorian block, was my private world. No one was allowed in. No one, that is, except for Alan. I switched on the lights, drew the heavy linen curtains and phoned him. We'd planned to see a film the following night, but this was no longer possible. It was pointless to make any plans until the case was finished. Alan took the news calmly, as he always did when I had to break a date. Well, good luck with the case, he said. I hope it won't be love's labours lost. I didn't get it. Barone, he explained. Interesting name. Barone was a lord in Shakespeare's play. I was getting ready for bed when I saw there was a message on the answer phone. Kate, I heard, this is Joe Mason, your grandmother's social worker. There's been some trouble. Mrs Miskin went to collect her pension this afternoon, and when she came back she found a window smashed. Please ring me as soon as you get in. If it's after 5.30, would you ring your grand direct? This is really urgent. Oh, there you are, was Gran's greeting when I rang. Fine time to call. You all right, Gran? Of course I'm not bloody all right. When are you coming round? I'll try to look in tomorrow, but it won't be easy. I'm in the middle of a case. 
Better come at three. Mrs. Mason says she's looking at three. She wants to see you special. Three o'clock, mind. And she put the phone down. I thought, oh, God. I can't cope with this again, not now. Not just at the beginning of a new case. I'd done everything possible to make my grandmother independent. To avoid having her come to live with me. But that, I knew, was what my grandmother, in alliance with her social worker, was inexorably pressing me to accept. I couldn't do it. I couldn't give up my freedom. I couldn't give up Alan. I had a right to my own life. Pembroke Lodge was a low, elegant Edwardian villa in Hampstead, in its own grounds, set well back from the road. Although on the staff of two major London teaching hospitals, this was Stephen Lampard's personal domain, and I had no doubt, a highly profitable one. I know, of course, why you're here. Lady Barone phoned me soon after she'd heard the news, and I called at the house. I wanted to offer what help I could to her and to Lady Ursula. This really is an appalling business. Are you any clearer yet what exactly happened? Both their throats were cut. We don't yet know why or by whom. I see. So, what do you want of me, Commander? I'd like you to talk to us about Sir Paul. We need to know as much about him as possible. I don't think I can give you much help. I suppose he must have had political enemies, but they're not the sort to go in for murder. Unless... You have someone in mind, sir? No, no, Inspector. I was thinking, possibly, of someone on the radical fringes of society. But it's more than unlikely. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Sarah, his daughter, strongly disliked his politics. But I've absolutely no reason to suppose that the set she's mixed up with, or even her radical boyfriend, would go in for razor-slashing. What set is that? Oh, some extremist revolutionary outfit. The exact name escapes me. And a boyfriend, sir. Who is he? Ivor Garrod, leading member of Renter Mob. I've only met him once. Sarah brought him to dinner about five months ago, principally, I imagine, to annoy Papa. A ghastly occasion. From what he said, the violence he advocates is on a somewhat grander scale than merely cutting the throat of a single Tory ex-minister. When did you last see Sir Paul Barone? About six weeks ago. Actually, I was hoping to see him this week. I wanted to discuss his decision to drop out of public life. I was concerned for Lady Barone. Barbara. She's my cousin. We've known each other since childhood. I have an interest. How strong an interest? I don't want to marry her, if that's what you're implying. For the past few years, I've been her lover as well as her cousin. You could call that a strong interest, I suppose. Did her husband know? I've no idea. Anyway, he was hardly in a position to object. He had a mistress, as I've no doubt you've discovered. Or haven't you grubbed out that piece of dirt yet? I'm interested to know how you managed to grub it out. Barbara told me of her suspicions about 18 months ago, and I got hold of a suitably discreet private detective on her behalf, and had him followed. She just wanted to know. I don't think she saw the woman as a serious rival. Actually, I suspect she was quite pleased. It gave her something to hold over Paul if the need arose, and of course it freed her from the disagreeable necessity of sleeping with him regularly. We shall, of course, need to know this woman's name and address. Of course, Commander. But I may say the information made very little difference to Barbara. She didn't lock her bedroom door against her husband. Barbara liked an occasional assurance that he was still suitably enthralled. I wondered whether his willingness to talk so freely arose from arrogance, or whether there was a more sinister motive. Lampard wouldn't be the first murderer to believe that if you told the police details they had no right to demand, they'd be less likely to suspect other, more dangerous secrets. There was
was an almost unbroken stream of traffic past the front gate of Pembroke Lodge, and I had to wait before it was safe to filter in. I spent the time wondering just how Adam Dalgleish did it, how he'd managed to extract so much information from Stephen Lampart. Where had AD been so clever? Did you enjoy yourself, Kate? Yes, sir. I must admit it. I like the sense of being in control. Is that wrong? No. No one joins the police without getting some enjoyment out of exercising power. The danger begins when the pleasure becomes an end in itself. That's when it's time to think about getting another job. I'm only sorry we got so little about Teresa Nolan out of him. This dinner at the Black Swan, sir. You and Lady Barone were there, both of you, on the evening of the 7th of August, when Diana Travers drowned. You obviously know we were. It was Lady Barone's 27th birthday party. And you escorted her, not her husband. He was expected to join us later, but rang to say he couldn't make it. Since you know so much, you must also know that we left before the tragedy. And that other tragedy, sir, Theresa Nolan... You weren't, of course, present when that happened either. If you mean, did I sit by her side in Holland Park while she swallowed a bottle of distal Jesic tablets? No, I wasn't. She left a note, making it plain that she'd killed herself because of guilt over her abortion. She was one of your nurses here. I wonder why she didn't have the operation at Pembroke Lodge. I wouldn't have done it. I don't operate on my own staff. Actually, I can't see how her death, or that of Diana Travers, has anything to do with Sir Paul's death. Ought we to be wasting time with irrelevant questions? Not irrelevant. Sir Paul received letters suggesting that he was somehow connected with these two deaths. I see. Well, I knew absolutely nothing of the Travers girl except that she worked in the Barone house as a part-time domestic, and that she was at the Black Swan on the night of the birthday party. As for Theresa Nolan, she came here after nursing Lady Ursula. She had a midwifery qualification, and she was perfectly satisfactory. She must have got pregnant when she was working in the Barone house. But I didn't ask by whom, and, well, she never said. Did it occur to you that the child could have been Sir Paul's? Yes, it occurred to me. It occurred to a lot of people. What happened when she discovered she was pregnant? She came and told me she wanted a termination. I referred her to a psychiatrist and left him to make the necessary arrangements. After the operation, she came back here. A week later, well, you know what happened. He had the means. Mm. He could have stopped off at the church on the way to the Black Swan, leaving Lady Barone in the car. He had the knowledge, he had the motive. I don't think he wanted to marry the lady, but he certainly didn't want an impoverished mistress. Mm. And heaven knows what Sir Paul was planning to do with his money following that religious conversion of his. But Lampart's a doctor. There are more subtle methods available to him than throat slitting. But killing without arousing suspicion isn't easy, sir, even for a doctor. And if he could have pulled this off, it would have been the perfect murder. It wouldn't have even been considered murder. It was Harry Mack who did for him. Without that second killing, wouldn't we have taken it at its face value as suicide? Except for the mistake of half burning the diary and taking away the matches. In some ways, the clue of that half burnt match is the most interesting in the case. How do you think it happened, sir? The murderer must have known there'd be a lot of blood. I think he was naked when he killed, naked to the waist at least so that he could wash it away afterwards. There was no sign of a struggle, so Sir Paul could have been pulled down by something slipped around his neck, a scarf, a towel, even a noose of some sort, and half throttled. Wouldn't that leave a mark? Not necessarily. Not when he'd finished his butchery. Then Harry Mack appears. Something of a shock, I imagine. So he has to be dealt with. Then to the washroom for a sluice down, back into his clothes, then... Last of all, he burns the diary, and perhaps out of habit, slips the matchbox into his pocket. A simple mistake, which rules out suicide completely. A half-burnt match, and no trace of the box it came from. Sarah Barone lived in a gaunt Victorian terrace of five-storey houses on the Cromwell Road. 
She was, I knew, only in her early twenties, but she looked much older. She gave a nod of acknowledgment as I introduced Kate, then stood aside and motioned us across the hall and into the sitting room. And we found ourselves facing Ivor Garrett, his features already familiar to us from the files lying on my desk in the office. You're here about my father's death, of course. I don't think I can help much, can I, Ivor? Sarah hasn't seen him or spoken to him for over three months. But Miss Matlock says she was at Camden Hill Square on Tuesday afternoon. Yes, to see my grandmother. I wanted to find out what was happening. You know, my father's resignation, that business about his experience in the church. But she was out and I didn't wait. I left about 4.30. Did you go into the study? The study? Oh, I suppose you're thinking of his diary. I was in the study, but I didn't see it. But you knew where he kept it? Of course, in the desk drawer. We all knew that. Why do you ask? In the hope that you might have seen it. It would have been useful to know that it was there at 4.30. We can't trace your father's movements after he left a Kensington estate agent at half past 11. We don't even know what happened, except what Sarah has learned from her grandmother. Was it murder? Oh, I don't think there can be any doubt that this is a murder case. The tramp, Harry Mack, certainly didn't slit his own throat. His death may not be of shattering significance, but no doubt his life had some importance, at least to him. If you're asking us to provide an alibi for Harry Mack's murder, then we were here together from six o'clock on Tuesday until nine o'clock on Wednesday morning. We had supper here. A mushroom flan, if you want the details. But, Daddy, what happened to Daddy? We're treating it as a suspicious death. I can't say much more until we get the result of the post-mortem and the forensic tests. So your father didn't see you or write to you? He didn't explain what happened in that church or why he was giving up his job and his parliamentary seat. I don't suppose he thought I cared one way or the other. My God, he couldn't even get converted like an ordinary man. He had to be granted his own personal beatification. Does that matter? Not to me. I suppose Grandmama minds. And his wife, of course. She thought she was marrying the next Prime Minister but one. She wouldn't relish being tied to a religious crank. Well, she's free of him now. And he's free of us. All of us. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I... Don't mind me. I'll be all right in a minute. Could any more questions wait until another time? Miss Barone is upset. I can see that. If she wants us to leave, of course we shall. You go, Ivor. I'm all right. You've said what you came to say. You were here with me on Tuesday night, all night. We were together. And there's nothing you can say about my father. You never knew him. So why don't you go? As you wish. If you need me, just ring. Just a moment. Diana Travers and Teresa Nolan. What do you know about them? Only that they're both dead. I do occasionally see the Paternoster Review. The recent article about Sir Paul was partly based on a scurrilous note sent to him and others. Kate? This note, Mr. Garrett. You aren't surely suggesting that Barone cut his throat because someone sent him an unkind letter? No. I was merely wondering whether you or Miss Barone had any idea who could have sent it. I admit I took for granted that the child Teresa Nolan aborted was Barone's. I didn't feel called upon to do anything about it. I only met the girl once at an unfortunate dinner party at Campton Hill Square. Lady Ursula was brought up to know which room people are entitled to dine in. Nurse Nolan was eating out of her station and was made to feel it. Not intentionally. Oh, I didn't say it was intentional. Women like your grandmother are offensive merely by existing. Yes, John. There's been a development, sir. Harrow Road have just been on the phone. A couple walked into the station ten minutes ago, a 21-year-old and his girl. They say they were on the towpath on Tuesday evening and passed through the turnstile by St Matthew's just before seven. There was a large black Vauxhall parked outside the south door. I knew Ivor would come back that night. I walked out onto the balcony 
gazed out into the darkness, and made myself think about my father. I could recall the precise moment things changed between us. We'd been living in Chelsea, just my parents, myself, and Matty. The phone call came at seven o'clock on a misty August morning. I answered the phone in the hall and was given the news just as my father came down the stairs. He saw my face and stopped. His hand on the banister. I looked up at him. It's Uncle Hugo's colonel, Daddy. Hugo's dead. Our eyes met and held for a moment, and I saw it clearly. The mixture of exultation and wild hope. The knowledge that now he could have Barbara. It lasted only a second. Time moved on. But nothing afterwards could ever be the same between us. Everything that followed, the car accident, my mother's death, his marriage to Barbara less than five months later, all seemed only the inevitable consequence of that moment. It was after eleven before Ivor arrived, and I was very tired. He wasted no time on preliminaries. Wasn't very clever, was it? Allow yourself to be left alone with probably the most dangerous detective in London and his fascist sidekick. It wasn't like that. They were quite human. You haven't any idea what the police are like. Just get it into your head. Dalgleish knows you'll come into a fair amount of money. He knows you've got a lover who doesn't care a damn about this rotten society and would like to get his hands on that legacy. So he's got a motive and a very satisfactory suspect. Just what the establishment are hoping for. Now he can get down to fabricating the evidence. You don't really believe that. For heaven's sake, Sarah! There's only one way with the police: tell them nothing. I suppose if I'm actually arrested, you'll let me tell them where I really was on Tuesday night. I'm not sure I oughtn't to tell them anyway. Tell them what? The code names of eleven people whose real names and addresses you don't even know. Point them to a semi where they'll find nothing incriminating. The moment a policeman sets foot in the safe house, the cell is disbanded, reformed, rehoused. We're not fools. What's more, there is a procedure for treachery. What procedure? Throwing me in the Thames, slitting my throat. Don't be ridiculous. Ivor, where were you on Tuesday night? You have never been late for a cell meeting before. There was a hold-up on the tube. I explained at the time. I wasn't at St Matthew's cutting your father's throat, if that's what you're implying. And until this case is over, we better not meet. If necessary, I'll get in touch with you in the usual way. Until Jean-Paul Higgins took it over, the Black Swan had been a modest riverside pub. The Black Swan was close enough to London to attract a fair number of regulars, people willing to drive the twenty odd miles to enjoy the excellent food. Monsieur Jean-Paul, small and dark, greeted Kate and me at the door as if there were nothing he'd been looking for to more than a visit from the police. He confirmed that Lady Barone and Mr. Lampart had dined in the restaurant three days earlier and produced his list of bookings to prove it. He remembered that they had arrived a little before a quarter to nine and had left shortly after eleven. When I turned to the night Diana Travers had drowned, Monsieur Jean Paul remained as helpful as before. He remembered Dominic Swain's party only too well. Not the kind of client we usually attract. It was not agreeable. I was relieved when they left the dining room. Sir Paul wasn't with his wife's party, I understand. That is so. When they arrived, Mr. Lampard said that Sir Paul hoped to join them later, but he phoned at around ten to say that it would not, after all, be possible. Who took the call? I asked. My doorman, Henry. Henry believes that ten minutes earlier he actually saw Sir Paul in the car park. We sent for Henry. Oh yes, sir, I saw him. How certain are you it was Sir Paul Barone? Pretty positive, sir. Do you know what car he drives? Black Vauxhall, I think. There was no Vauxhall in the car park that evening, though. 
and about ten minutes after you saw him, Sir Paul rang to say he wouldn't be arriving after all. That's right, sir. And that's all you can tell us? Well, it seems daft when I come to think about it. Go on. He was walking quickly and in the shadow of the hedge, but there was something about the way his jacket was clinging. His trousers, too. I'll swear he was wet, sir. Soaking wet. I think he'd been in the river. But even odder is that he wasn't walking away from the river. He was walking towards it. The main purpose of our visit to the Black Swan had been achieved. Lampard's alibi held. But the visit had served another purpose. Now, more than ever, I was convinced that the three deaths were linked. Sir Paul... Diana Travers, and Theresa Nolan. Scarsdale Lodge was a modern L-shaped block of flats in Stanmore, conveniently on the route to Paul Barone's Hertfordshire constituency. Number 46 was a corner flat on the top floor. A.D. and I trod silently along the carpeted corridor and stopped at a white door with Carol Washburn neatly printed beneath the bell push. The door was opened almost immediately. You know why we're here, of course, Miss Washburn. Do you feel able to talk about him? The first she'd heard about the double death was on the television news. The shock had been profound. Now A.D. gave her the details. Having heard them, curiously, it was her lover's religious experience, not his murder, that she needed most to talk about. I knew then I'd lost him. Not as a friend, perhaps, but then I didn't want him as a friend. I'd lost him as a lover. I'd lost him forever. Did he ever suggest marriage? Forgive me, this question could be important. You think someone could have slit his throat to prevent him asking for a divorce so that he could marry me? You're wasting your time. No, he never suggested marriage. And neither did I. Did he tell you he had a poison pen letter about Theresa Nolan and Diana Travers? Yes, he told me. And if you're thinking that Theresa Nolan's child, the one she aborted, was his, you're mistaken. He'd certainly have told me. Look, it was just a poison pen letter. Politicians get them all the time. And what does it matter now? The scandal and the lies. They can't hurt him. Nothing can. Not anymore. Were there things that did hurt him? He was human, wasn't he? Of course there were. What things? His wife's infidelity... Miss Washburn, my priority is catching his murderer, not preserving his reputation. I'll try to see that they're not incompatible, but I'm clear what has to come first. Shouldn't you be? No. I've preserved his privacy for three years. It's cost me a lot, but I'm not complaining. I knew the rules. We could never be seen together, and I always took second place. To his job, his wife, his constituents, his mother. There were a lot of things I couldn't give him. But I could give him secrecy, discretion. And that I intend to continue giving him. You'll catch Paul's murderer, Commander Dalgleish. But you'll have to do it without me. I'm not going to break his confidences just so you can notch up another success. Goodbye, Commander. Mrs Iris Minns did general housework four days a week for the Barones. We got her address from Miss Matlock, a council flat on the second floor of a block off the Portobello Road. As we crossed the wide courtyard, John Massingham said, I'll do the talking. I felt the familiar spurt of resentment, but said nothing. We found ourselves facing a small, compact figure with a square face, a round, determined chin, and a pair of dark, almost black eyes which gave us a quick appraising glance as if inspecting us for dust. She motioned me to one of the two armchairs and took the other herself, leaving John to turn a dining chair round and perch somewhat uncomfortably on it. Lady Ursula said you'd be along sooner or later when she phoned me with the news. So that was the first you'd heard of Sir Paul's death, when his mother rang to warn you? Warn me? No call to warn me. I didn't slit his throat for him, poor man. Mind you, you'd have thought Miss Matlock might have taken the trouble to phone earlier. That would have been better than me hearing it on the six o'clock news. 
Lady Ursula rang just before nine, nuss of her to trouble. But then we've always got on well, me and Lady Ursula. Mind you, she didn't tell me much. What happened? Suicide, was it? We can't be sure, Mrs Minns. Not until we know more results of tests and so on. When did you last see Sir Paul? Just before he went out, on Tuesday. About half past ten, that would be. We was in the library. I'd gone in to polish the desk, and they was sitting there. So I said, I'll come back later, and he said, No, come in, Mrs Minns, I won't be long. What was he doing? Like I said, sitting at his desk. He had his diary open. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I think I don't know a diary when I see one. After he'd finished writing in it, he closed it up, put it in the top right-hand drawer where it's usually kept. Anything else happened between you? Not much. I asked him if I could borrow one of his books. Borrow one of his books? That's right. I'd seen it on the bottom shelf when I'd been dusting, and I fancied reading it. It's there, under the television, if you're interested. A Rose by Twilight by Millicent Gentle. I haven't seen a book by her for years. She reached for it in its luridly romantic dust jacket and handed it to John. He flicked through and passed it over to me. Hardly his kind of reading, I'd have thought. I took the book and opened it. On the flyleaf was written, To Paul Barone with every good wish from the author. Underneath was the signature, Millicent Gentle. And the date, the 7th of August. It was the date of Diana Travers drowning. Apparently John hadn't noticed. I closed the book. We'll take this book back to Camden Hill Square if you've finished with it, Mrs Minns. Please yourself. Uh, I wasn't thinking of pinching it, if that's what you're thinking. What happened after Sir Paul gave you the book? He went out, didn't he? Heard the front door open and shut. And you're certain he put the diary back in the drawer? He didn't take it with him. Look, what is it about the diary? Are you saying I stole it or something? It isn't in the drawer now, Mrs Minns. Of course, we don't suspect anyone of taking it. But it could be important. You see, if he did make an appointment for the next day, then it isn't very likely he meant to kill himself. I see. Well, he didn't take it with him. I saw him put it back with my own eyes. And if he did come back for it later, it wasn't while I was in the house. When did you leave? Five o'clock, my usual time. Sir Paul's marriage, Mrs Minns. Would you say it was a happy one? Hardly ever saw them together. When I did, they seemed all right. Never shared a bedroom, though. Some couples prefer not to. Maybe, but there's not sharing and not sharing, if you get my meaning. I make the beds, you see. That may be your idea of a marriage, but it's not mine. Hardly the way to produce the next baronet. Well, I did wonder about that a few weeks ago. Off her breakfast she was, and that isn't like her. But not much chance, I reckon, too worried about her figure. Mind you, she's all right when she's in a good mood. Too gushing, though. Old Mrs Minns be a darling and fetch my dressing gown. Mrs Minns be an angel and run a bath for me. Sweet as sugar, as long as she gets her own way. There were no quarrels, then, as far as you know? Not till Tuesday morning, anyway. And then you could hardly call it a quarrel. Takes two to quarrel. She was screeching fit to reach the whole house, but I didn't hear much from him. When was this, Mrs Minns? When I took up her breakfast tray at half past eight. I got to the bedroom door when I heard her screeching. You're going to that door. You can't, not now. We need you. We both need you. I won't let you go. Something like that. And then I heard his voice very low. I stood outside the door wondering what to do when he came out. White as paper he was. He saw me and said, I'll take the tray, Mrs Minns. So I gave it to him. And he took it into the bedroom? That's right, and shut the door, and I went back to the kitchen. Uh, let's get back to the library. Who else went in there that Tuesday? Let's see. Um, Mr Musgrave from the constituency office. He waited from half past twelve to nearly two, hoping Sir Paul would come back for lunch. Then Miss Sarah was there about four o'clock. She'd come to see her grandma. Must have got fed up waiting and let herself out. 
Only one more thing, Mrs. Mince. This um, Diana Travers, how did you get on with her? Oh, supposed to be a cleaner. Never done it in her life before, you could see that. Actress, she said she was, looking for work. Wanted a job she could chuck if anything turned up. And did you get on well with her? No reason why not. Bit nosy. Found her one day looking in a drawer of Sir Paul's desk. Bold as brass about it. Just laughed. No harm in her, though. I liked her, otherwise I wouldn't have let her live here. You mean she lived here? With you? No one told us that. Well, they didn't know, did they? No reason why they should. She left about ten days before the accident. What did she do with herself while she was living here? I hardly saw her. Two mornings a week she worked in Camden Hill Square. The rest of the time she said she was off on auditions. She went out a good bit at night, but she never brought anyone here. Then the evening after she drowned, before the inquest even, these two chaps turn up. Just when I got back from Camden Hill Square, sitting in their car watching out for me, said they were from a solicitor's, come to collect any of her things she might have left here. Did they show you any identity, any authority? A letter from the firm, posh writing paper, and they had a card, so I let them in. I stayed by the door and watched them, mine. There's nothing here, I said. She left nearly a fortnight ago. They probably turned the place over. Found nothing, of course. Mm. Who do you think they were? <laughs> Come off it! They were two of your lot. Fuzz! Think I don't know a policeman when I see one? bring away that novel. Millicent Gentle's signature is dated the 7th of August. That's the day Diana Travers died. So it's on the cards that Barone met Millicent Gentle that day and she gave him the book. Oh yes. Could be. It's also possible she signed it on the 7th and left it for him at his constituency office or posted it to his London address. Those men, John. The ones who searched Diana Travers' room. Who do you think they were? Special branch? That's my guess. Oh. Look, Kate, either Travers worked for them and they planted her in Camden Hill Square, or she worked for some much more sinister organisation and they rumbled her. If they were special branch, there's going to be trouble. Come to think of it, they did tell us about Barone's mistress. Knowing that we'd have discovered all about Carol Washburn for ourselves quickly enough. That is typical of special branch. Their idea of cooperation is make sure you don't tell them anything they don't know already. I decided to drive alone that Saturday afternoon to see Teresa Nolan's grandparents in their Surrey cottage. Mrs. Nolan, a small-boned elderly woman with a sharp, anxious face, opened the door and led me into the square sitting room. Her husband was sitting facing the window and responded to my greeting with a stiff nod. I explained that I was investigating Sir Paul Barone's death, and that shortly before he died he'd had an anonymous letter suggesting that he might have had something to do with their granddaughter's death. Shaken, Mrs. Nolan said that Teresa had taken her own life, and that the anonymous letter certainly hadn't been sent from their cottage. I hastened to reassure her that we'd never thought it had, but I wondered whether Teresa had ever talked to them about anyone, a close friend perhaps who might have blamed Sir Paul for her death. Mrs. Nolan turned to him. She insisted there was no proof, and that he was a married man, and Teresa wouldn't ever do such a thing. Albert Nolan maintained that there was no knowing what she might have done. After all, first she got the baby, then the abortion, then she committed suicide. What was one more sin when you've got that on your conscience? Mrs. Nolan offered to show me Teresa's room, I followed her up the narrow staircase. The room was at the back of the cottage, small, north-facing. The furniture was minimal, the bed had been stripped. Having nothing to remember but grief, 
then divested the room even of her personality, and closed the door. I had no hope now of learning anything useful at the Nolan's cottage, but my instinct to search made me pull open the drawer of the bedside cabinet. Then I saw that something of Teresa did remain, her missal. I picked it up and leafed through it. A small square of paper torn from a notebook fell out. Picking it up, I found myself looking at three short columns of figures and letters. And that's what today's brush with reality has brought me, I thought, as I eased the car gently back onto the road. A full measure of the Nolan's bitterness and pain, and a scrap of paper with a few letters and digits jotted down, perhaps not even by Teresa herself. We were in the office all next day, Sunday. At about a quarter to seven in the evening, the phone on my desk rang. D.I. Miskin. It's Carol Washburn. I want to see you. There's something I've decided to tell you. Well, we'll come round now. No, not here. I don't want you to come here. Not ever again. I'll meet you tomorrow morning, nine o'clock. The formal garden in Holland Park, the one near the orangery. Do you know it? Yes, I know. It will be there. I don't want Commander Dalgleish. I don't want any male officer. Just you. I won't talk to anyone else. Right. Can you give me any idea what it's about? It's about the death of Teresa Nolan. My interview with Miles Gilmartin of Special Branch, elegant in impeccable grey, was enlightening if frustrating. We're supposed to be on the same side, I said. Paul Barone was murdered. If I can't get cooperation from you, where can I expect it? Sorry we didn't tell you earlier that Travers was one of our operatives, said Gilmartin. Earlier? I said you didn't tell me at all. I had to discover it for myself. I suppose Barone really was murdered, said Gilmartin. There's a rumour it could have been suicide. He was murdered, I said. And this girl, Diana Travers, was she the most suitable person you could find to spy on a minister of state? Even for special branch, it seems an odd choice. But she wasn't assigned to Barone, said Gilmartin. What made you think that? The target was Ivor Garrard. We infiltrated her into his cell. I see. And you conveniently forgot to mention the fact when we inquired about Garrod. You must have known he was a suspect. He still is. Well, you don't have to look any further for the writer of your poison pen letters, said Gilmartin. Undermining the government by discrediting ministers was just a small part of his game. Travers discovered that. But her work for us had nothing to do with Barone's death. Maybe not, I said. But her death may be connected to the case in other ways. Her death, said Gilmartin, was for natural causes. The autopsy proves it. She ate and drank too much, plunged into cold water, got tangled in the reeds, and drowned. There were no suspicious marks on the body, and, as you're doubtless aware, she'd had sex just before. There seemed little point continuing the discussion. I'm surprised you thought Garrod worth the trouble, I said. Garrod's connections would surprise you, said Gilmartin. Oh, yes, he's worth it. I can assure you of that. I woke early on Monday morning, impatient for the forthcoming interview with Carol Washburn. Holland Park was only a few minutes' walk from my block, and just before nine I made my way to the terrace above the formal gardens. When we met, we began walking together down a mushy path between the woodlands. After a while, Carol paused and looked into the wilderness. See that slanting silver birch? That's where he found Teresa Nolan, over there. We came here together a week later. I think he needed to show me. When the nursing home rang to ask if anyone at Camden Hill Square knew where she was, Paul guessed that she might be here. He must have known Teresa Nolan very well. Perhaps. She used to talk to him in the night hours when Lady Ursula was asleep. Tell him about herself, her family. The child Teresa Nolan was carrying. Could it have been his? Once I'd have said no, and been absolutely certain. I'm not certain of anything anymore. I thought Paul always told me everything, that there was nothing hidden between us. Yesterday, I learned that there were things he didn't tell me. Why, what happened? Barbara Barone came to see me, out of the blue. The doorbell rang, and there she was. Why, what did she come for? Oh, to satisfy her curiosity about me. That was one reason, I've no doubt. 
but it wasn't the main one. Her main purpose was to gloat, if she could. She asked me if I was pregnant. When I told her I wasn't, she announced that she was, and that there was no doubt the baby was Paul's. She wouldn't have said it if a DNA test afterwards could disprove it, so it must be true. It came as a terrible shock. Paul never gave me any hint that he was still sleeping with Barbara. So you're not sure about Teresa? Not one hundred percent. And Paul didn't tell the whole truth about finding her body either. There were two letters in her jacket pocket. One was addressed to her grandparents, asking their forgiveness. That was read out at the inquest. But there was another, addressed to Paul. That's what I've come to tell you. Did you see it? No. He brought it to the flat, but he didn't let me read it. He told me what was in it. Apparently, while Teresa was nursing at Pembroke Lodge, one of the patients had been brought some champagne by her husband, and she'd become a bit tipsy. She was gloating over the baby, a son after three girls, and she said, "Thanks to darling Stephen." Then she let out that if patients wanted a child of a particular sex, Lampart would do an early amniocentesis. And abort an unwanted fetus. Women who weren't prepared to go through a pregnancy to get a child of the wrong sex knew where to go. But he was—he is taking a terrible risk. Not really. There's nothing on paper. Teresa tried to get some evidence, but it wasn't easy. So that was the explanation of the mysterious jottings which A. D. had found in Teresa's missile. Of course, she didn't dare speak to anyone about all this. What could she hope to do against a powerful man like Stephen Lampart? In any case, how could she talk about his mortal sin when she was about to commit a mortal sin herself? But she thought that before she died, she had to do something to put a stop to it. She thought about Paul. He was a minister, a powerful man. He'd see that it was stopped. And did he? How could he? Lampart's his wife's lover. It would look like blackmail, or worse, revenge. So he tore up the letter in my presence, and flushed it down the lavatory. He said, "If I haven't the courage to use it, then I must get rid of it." Before he did that, he made me promise to say nothing. Of course, I gave my word. Now I've broken it. He took absolutely no action. You're sure of that? He may have spoken to Lampart, told him he knew what was going on, but had no evidence. Paul said he'd do that, but I don't know if he did. We never discussed it again. What he did do was take his money out of Pembroke Lodge. There was quite a bit, I think, originally invested by his brother. We began walking slowly down the path. I thought, suppose Paul Barone had spoken to Lampart. With the evidence destroyed, the doctor would have little to fear. A scandal could hurt Sir Paul as much as it harmed Lampart. But after Barone's experience in that church, perhaps with his own career thrown away, he might see it as his moral duty to expose and ruin Lampart. And what of Barbara? On the one hand, a husband who's chucked away job and prospects and is even proposing to sell their home; on the other, a lover who might be facing ruin. But could Lampart and Barbara really have had the time? Someone, Barone or his killer, had been using the washroom at St Matthew's at eight o'clock. So either Barone was alive at eight, or the murderer was still on the premises. Either way, it was difficult to see how Lampart could have been sitting in the dining room of the Black Swan before quarter to nine. All the same, I decided to ask the question. Miss Washburn, do you think Stephen Lampart killed Sir Paul? With or without his wife's connivance, no. He'd be a fool to involve her in anything like that, and she hasn't the courage or the wit to plan it alone. But I've given you a motive, a motive for both of them. It ought to be enough to make life uncomfortable for her. Is that what you want? <laughs> no, that's not what I want. I want her to be harried and grilled and frightened. I want her disgraced. I want her arrested, imprisoned for life. I want her dead. It won't happen. None of it. And the awful thing is that I've hurt myself more than I can ever hurt her. He told me in confidence. He trusted me. He always trusted me. I broke his confidence. 
I broke the sacred bond between us. Once I'd phoned you, once I'd asked you to meet me, there was no turning back. Now there's nothing left. Nothing of our loving that will ever be free of pain and guilt. Yes, Kate. Something interesting, sir. We've just got Millicent Gentle's address from her publishers. She'd moved and they took some time to trace her. She's living at Riverside Cottage, Coldham Lane, near Cookham. I've looked it up. Coldham Lane runs almost opposite to the Black Swan. She must have given Sir Paul her book on August the 7th. Seems likely. Ring her, Kate. Ask if she'll see us tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, I'll see you at Pembroke Lodge. This alleged letter, Commander... Theresa Nolan was psychologically disturbed. Something written just before she killed herself couldn't possibly count as reliable evidence. Even if you have this letter, which I assume you haven't, we both know it would be worthless in a court of law. Are you telling us, Mr Lampard, that the girl's story is untrue? To be charitable, let's say mistaken. Or possibly she, or perhaps Barone, were lying. But if this so-called letter is meant to give me a motive, it's absurd. I didn't kill Barone. Even if I were capable of such a brutal murder, I certainly wouldn't take Barone's wife with me and expect her to wait in the car while I slit her husband's throat. The whole idea is absurd. And Theresa Nolan's belief about the abortion of healthy fetuses because they weren't the sex the mother wanted. A total, unprovable fabrication, Inspector. All operations done here in Pembroke Lodge are fully recorded. The pathological reports are in the medical records, and I can assure you that there's nothing incriminating in any file in this building. The allegation is ridiculous. But Paul Barone believed it. He got rid of his shares in Pembroke Lodge after Theresa Nolan's death. I think he spoke to you. I don't know what he said, but I can guess. No, we never spoke. And assuming he did believe it, he'd have been in an odd position, morally speaking. He wanted a son and heir. He certainly didn't want another daughter. Nor, incidentally, did Barbara, who'd had one miscarriage, a female, eight months after their marriage. So even assuming the story is true, although Barone couldn't stomach the means, he wouldn't have been displeased with the ends. No wonder he was a psychological mess. So Theresa Nolan was on to something. I'll be frank with you, Commander. <laughs> if I had aborted those unwanted fetuses, it wouldn't weigh on my conscience. A woman has a right to choose whether she bears a child. I happen to think she also has a right to choose which sex. No child should be unwanted. And a two-month fetus isn't a human being. It's a collection of tissue. In my book, we've the right to do anything we can to make human life more agreeable, safer, Less full of pain. Provided, presumably, we don't hurt other people and the act isn't illegal. Getting rid of an unwanted fetus hurts no one. But aborting a fetus that's not wanted because of its sex, that's certainly outside the law. It was practically a confession, sir. He was justifying it. But we'll never be able to use it in court. And it was a confession to medical malpractice, not murder. Well, what about the murder, sir? Lampard had means and motive, and he's got the knowledge and the arrogance to think he can get away with it. But what about opportunity? He was at the Black Swan just after 8.30. Yes. That water flowing from the vestry waste pipe at 8 o'clock, are we being misled by that? If Barone had died at the earliest possible time... At 7 o'clock, isn't it, sir? That's right. What happens to Lampard's alibi then? Someone was responsible for the tap running in the church kitchen at 8 o'clock, but who? And whoever turned it on, did the same person turn it off? Tuesday morning couldn't have heralded a better day for a drive out of London. If Kate thought we'd drive straight to Riverside Cottage, I disappointed her. 
The road passed the Black Swan, and when we reached it, I stopped and turned into the car park. Opposite, and about twenty yards downstream, I could see a bungalow. This, I guessed, was our destination, and I knew, too, that that's where I'd find the clue I sought. As we looked, the dumpy figure of a woman came out of the side door and made her way to the landing stage, a dog trotting at her heels. She lowered herself into a dinghy, cast off, and began rowing across the river towards the Black Swan. You must be Miss Millicent Gentle. If so, we're on our way to see you. This is Inspector Kate Miskin. Hello. I'm Adam Dalglish. I wasn't expecting you for another half hour, Commander. How pleasant to meet you like this. I'd row you across, but it would have to be one at a time, and that would be rather slow. I'm afraid it's five miles by road, but perhaps you have a car. Indeed we do. Then I'll be waiting for you. I'll see you in about ten minutes. When Miss Gentle opened her door to us, we walked into cheerfulness and light. The dog, make peace, slumped down in front of the empty stove and heaved a malodorous sigh. Miss Gentle poured us coffee. How did you find me? It was the book you autographed for him on the 7th of August. Of course. We need to know exactly what happened that night. You did see him. Oh, yes. Let me explain. I get on very well with Mr. Jean-Paul Higgins, and having a big restaurant just across the river rarely bothers me. His customers are usually no trouble. But on that night, there were young people shouting and screaming. I was trying to work, and it got very irritating. So I went out to the bank, and I could see that there were four of them in a punt. Two of them were trying to change places, and they were rocking very dangerously. I tried to ring Mr. Higgins, but I couldn't get through. So Makepeace and I rowed across. I made for my usual spot, and as I turned the boat to draw up to the bank, I saw these two men. Do you know who they were? Not at the time. Afterwards, I knew one of them, Sir Paul Barone. What were they doing, Miss Gentle? Fighting. They didn't notice me, of course. Who won? Oh, Sir Paul. He landed what I think is called a hook to the jaw. The younger man fell. Then Sir Paul picked him up by the collar of his coat and his trousers and threw him into the river. He made quite a splash. And then? Sir Paul waded into the water and fished him out. He threw him down on the grass, said something, and walked upstream towards me. As he drew alongside, I popped up my head and said, Good evening. I don't suppose you remember me, but we met last June at the Hertfordshire Conservative Fete. I'm Millicent Gentle. What did he do? He came over and shook hands. He was dripping wet, of course, but was as self-possessed as when we'd met at the fete. I said, I saw the fight. You haven't killed him, have you? He said, no, I only wanted to. He was beginning to shiver, so I suggested he come back to the cottage and dry off. He said, that's very kind of you, but I think I'd better move the car. I suggested he park it somewhere at the side of the road, and that I row him across. He disappeared and was back in a few minutes. What happened to the other man? I didn't wait to see. I knew he'd be all right. He wasn't alone, you see. He had a girl with him. You're quite sure about that? Quite sure. She came out of the bushes and watched when Sir Paul threw him into the river. I couldn't have missed her. She was quite naked. This girl. Look. I have a photo. Do you recognise her? Isn't that the girl who was drowned? <gasps> yes. It could have been her. I didn't see her face very clearly, I'm afraid. The light was very poor, and they must have been 40 yards away. When Sir Paul flung this man into the water, what did she do? Roared with laughter. When Sir Paul waded in to help him out, she sat on the bank, quite naked, helpless with laughter. The scene was quite bizarre. Two men stumbling out of the river, and a naked girl sitting on the bank, roaring away. So when Sir Paul had moved his car, you rode him across. Could you still see the man and the girl? No. 
The river bends slightly. But I could still hear the girl laughing as I rode across. I had to go carefully. With Makepeace and a passenger, we were very low in the water. The girl. How long did she go on laughing? Until we were almost on the opposite bank. Then suddenly the laughing stopped. Did you hear a cry? A splash? No, nothing. What happened then? First, Sir Paul asked to use the telephone. I, I left him here and went into the kitchen. Then I suggested he have a hot bath. While he was in the bathroom, I put his clothes into the tumble dryer. Oh, I, I'd given him my father's old dressing gown to wear after his bath. So while we waited for his clothes to dry, we settled down in front of the fire and I made some hot cocoa. I told him about my work, and that's when I gave him a copy of my last book. Have you spoken of this to any other person? No one. I wouldn't have told you if you hadn't phoned, and he weren't dead. Please continue to say nothing, Miss Gentle. It could be very important. I thought I knew why Barone had been on the river bank. He'd arrived to join the dinner party, to greet his wife and Lampart, his wife's lover, to take part in a civilized charade. And then he'd heard the murmur of running water, and had been drawn to a few moments of solitude and peace. So he'd wandered down to the river. Such a small thing, a simple impulse, and it had led him to that blood-drenched vestry. Dominic Swain, his wife's brother had stepped out of the bushes. Did he already know that this was Teresa Nolan's lover, the father of her aborted child? Was this the one other secret that Teresa had confided to him in that final letter? Did he confront Swain with that knowledge? And when Sir Paul left you that night, that was the last time you saw him? Who oh, no. I, I saw him on the afternoon of his death. I thought you knew. Miss Gentle, how could we have known? I thought he'd have told someone where he was going. Is it important? Very important, Miss Gentle. Oh. Tell us what happened. There isn't much to tell. He arrived quite unexpectedly just before three o'clock. He was on foot and carrying a bag. He must have walked the four miles from the station. He said he felt like a walk along the river. He hadn't eaten, so I made him something, and then he set out for his walk. He returned about 4.30, and I made some tea. His shoes were very dirty, so I gave him my shoebox, and he sat outside on the steps and cleaned them. Then he took up his bag, said goodbye, and was on his way. It was as simple as that. As simple as that. The lost hours accounted for. He'd wanted to spend a few hours where no one in the world could find him. And then he must have gone straight from Paddington to St. Matthew's Church. We'd have to check the train times, but it was most unlikely he could have gone back to the house, collected the diary, and still been at the church by six. It's a new motive, sir. Swain must have hated him. The thrashing, the humiliation, thrown in the river, dragged out like a dog, and all in front of Diana Travers. Oh, yes, Swain must have hated him. So we had it at last. The motive not only for the murder, but for this particular murder with its mixture of planning and impulse, its brutality, the cleverness which hadn't quite been clever enough. I recognised the mind behind it. I'd met it before. The mind of a killer who isn't content to take a life, but who avenges humiliation with humiliation, who wants his victim not only dead, but disgraced. The mind of a man who has felt inferior all his life, but who will never feel inferior again. suddenly appeared in Scotland Yard asking to see me. She completely lost touch with young Darren Wilkes and had come to me as a last resort. 
I'm terribly sorry, Miss Wharton, I said, but I don't see how we can help. The juvenile court has made a supervision order to the local authority. It's their concern now. I know, she said. That's what the social worker Mrs Kendrick told me. But I thought you might be able to use your influence. We have no influence, Miss Wharton, not in this. Oh, please, Inspector, I'd be very careful. I wouldn't talk to him about the murder. Only I'd feel so much better if I could just see him again, just to know that he's all right. I thought for a moment. I don't know where Darren's living, but I do remember his school, Bollington Road Junior. Do you know it? Oh, yes, she said. I can get there. You could try passing at the time they come out. If you met him accidentally, I don't see how social work could object to that. Greatly cheered, Miss Wharton said goodbye to me. What happened shortly afterwards we learned only very much later. Miss Wharton had left the yard and was hesitating on the edge of the pavement when she heard someone say, Excuse me, but aren't you Miss Wharton? I'm Dominic Swain, Sir Paul's brother-in-law. You've been to the yard, haven't you? So have I. I feel in need of some refreshment. Do join me. Before she knew it, Miss Wharton was sitting in the bar of a nearby hotel, sipping a medium sherry. Swain lifted his G&T. Cheers. I'm in need of this after the grilling they gave me. I suppose they've been questioning you about the murders, too. Did they give you a bad time? Oh, no, it wasn't at all like that. And Miss Wharton explained the purpose of her visit, telling him all about Darren, how they'd visited the church regularly, and how they'd been the ones to find the body. You know, she said, a second sherry miraculously in her hand, I had a feeling while Darren and I were sitting there in the church waiting to be interviewed that there was something the boy knew, something he was keeping back, something that he was feeling, well, perhaps a little guilty about. You've told the police about this. Oh, no. It would sound so stupid. But the boy might have noticed something, something you didn't see. It was only a feeling I had. Perhaps I'll know more when I'm able to see him. I'm planning to meet him when he comes out of school. But he'll be with other children. He might be embarrassed to see you waiting there. Why not write him a note and ask him to meet you? Where did you usually meet? Oh, on the towpath. That's where we always met. I could take him a note if you like, said Swain. I'll give it to one of the other kids to deliver, or I'll ask one of them to point him out. Darren will get it, I promise. Look, let me write it for you. Suppose we make it Friday at four o'clock on the towpath. Would that be all right for you? Yes, yes, perfectly. Swain wrote quickly, folded the paper and put it in the envelope. What's his surname? Wilkes. He's Darren Wilkes. And the school is Bollington Road Junior. It's near Lisson Grove. He wrote the address. Then they finished their drinks and Swain insisted on summoning a taxi and paying the driver to take her home. After the taxi was out of sight, he took the message from the envelope and reread it. The time and place were exactly as he'd said, but the date wasn't Friday. It was the following afternoon, Thursday, and it wasn't Miss Wharton who'd be waiting on the towpath, but Swain himself. What a fiasco, Kate. Swain just sits there, with his brief by his side, smiling. I was with Miss Matlock all that evening. If you think otherwise... Prove it. Yeah, he's a cool one. I think it's back to Miss Matlock. If we can't break him, we'll have to break her. We've simply got to overturn that alibi of his. More than that. We must find some physical evidence. Well, the thing is, that Swain's confident the evidence doesn't exist. He can see her that our whole case is circumstantial. If we'd got something stronger, we'd have produced it by now, and he's actually saying what other people are thinking, that Barone got Teresa Nolan pregnant, rejected her, and killed himself, partly out of remorse, and partly because the dirt in Paternoster Review warned him that the scandal was about to break. My God, Kate. I hope the old man hasn't got it wrong. Dear Miskin. All right. I'll come now. What's the matter? It's my grandmother. She's been mugged. That was the hospital. They want me to collect her. I'll have to take the rest of the day off. Can't they get someone else to cope? There is no one else. 
Ah, Commander Dalgleish. How kind of you to come. Good evening, Father. I just have to clear the offertory boxes. Uh, not that I expect to find much. Some small change. Good gracious. Six one-pound coins. We never did as well as that before the murders. <clears throat> come with me, Commander. There's just the box in front of the grill. Ah, Miss Wharton. Hard at work as usual. There's never as much in here. Miss Wharton, who'd finished straightening the chairs in the Lady Chapel, came bustling up. I don't expect there'll be more than eighty pence, she said. I used to give Darren a ten-pence piece to light a candle, but really no one else uses this box. He loves stretching his hands out through the grill and striking the match. It's funny, but I'd forgotten about that until now. I suppose it was because he didn't have time to light the candle that dreadful morning. There it is, you see, still unlit. Only seven coins this time. And a button. Rather an unusual one. It looks like silver. Miss Wharton peered closer. That must have been Darren, she said. How naughty of him. I remember now he bent down by the path. I thought he was picking a flower. It really was very wrong of him to steal from the church. Poor child, it must have weighed on his conscience. No wonder I thought he was feeling guilty about something. I'm hoping to see him tomorrow. I'll have a little word about it. And she bustled away. May I see the button, Father? And there at last it was, resting on my palm, the piece of physical evidence we'd been seeking. I'd seen just such buttons before. They were a feature of the Italian jacket that Dominic Swain had been wearing the first time we'd seen him. A single button, so small a thing, but so vital. And we had two witnesses to its finding. I stood looking at it, and there came over me a feeling not of excitement or triumph, but of immense weariness, of completion. When was this box last cleared, Father? Two weeks ago, the morning of the day Sir Paul was murdered. I'm afraid I forgot to empty it last week. Father Barnes, I'm going to place this button in one of the envelopes from the little vestry. I'll then seal it and ask you to sign across the flap. But of course. Then this button's important? It's a clue? Yes, it's a clue. But do you suppose the owner will come looking for it? I don't think for one moment that he's missed it yet. I saw the owner wearing the jacket after the murder, and it seemed to have all its buttons. My guess is that this is the spare originally sewn inside the jacket on a tag. It must have worked loose. It was Sarah Barone who let us in. Without speaking, she led us across the hall to the library. Lady Ursula and Barbara Barone were seated at the table, which was stacked with letters and documents. Barbara Barone was painting her nails, impervious to her surroundings. Have you seen a button like this, Lady Ursula? Not to my knowledge. Looks as though it came from a man's jacket. Probably an expensive one. And you, Miss Barone? Let me see. No, it's not mine. That wasn't my question. I asked if you'd seen it or one like it. If I have, I can't remember. I'm not very interested in clothes. Why not ask my stepmother? Barbara Brone glanced up and denied ever having seen it. I knew she was lying, but not, I thought, through fear. For her, lying when in doubt was the easiest response, a way to postpone trouble. I turned to Lady Ursula and asked to speak to Miss Matlock. When Evelyn Matlock came in, she stood for a moment, her eyes fixed on Lady Ursula. Then she marched over to me and stood stiff as a soldier on a charge. Miss Matlock, I'm going to ask you a question. Please think carefully before you answer, and then tell me the truth. Have you ever seen this button, or one like it? Come closer, look at it carefully. When did you last see a button like this? I've seen something like it. I can't remember where. There must be hundreds of similar buttons. Try to remember. You've seen something like it. Where? In this house? 
Are you Dominic Swain's mistress, Miss Matlock? Is that why you're shielding him? Because you are shielding him, aren't you? Is that how he paid you? A quick half hour on your bed between his bath and his supper? He was getting it cheap, wasn't he? His alibi for murder? Chief Inspector! Really, Commander, apart from being offensive, I find that suggestion ridiculous. It's grotesque. Why is it ridiculous? Why is it grotesque? You can't bear to believe it, can you? You've had lovers enough in your time. Everyone knows that. You're notorious. Well, you're old now. Crippled and ugly, and no one wants you, man or woman. And you can't bear to think that someone might want me. Well, he did, and he does. He loves me. We love each other. He cares. He knows what my life is like in this house. I'm tired, I'm overworked, and I hate you all. Oh, you didn't know that, did you? You thought I was grateful. Grateful for the job of washing you like a baby. Grateful for waiting on a woman too idle to pick up her own underclothes from the floor. Grateful for the worst bedroom in the house. Grateful for a home, a bed, a roof, the next meal. And you, all of you, you think of no one but yourselves. Do this, Matty. Fetch that, Matty. Run me bath, Matty. I do have a name. He calls me Evelyn. That's my name. I'm not a cat or a dog. I didn't know you felt like this. I blame myself. No, you don't. Those are just words. You've never blamed yourself for anything, not all your life. Yes, I did sleep with Dominic, and I shall again. He loves me, and I love him. Don't be ridiculous. He was using you. He used you to get a free meal, hot bath, his clothes washed and ironed. And in the end, he used you to get an alibi for murder. Barbara Barone had finished her manicure. Now she surveyed her finished nails with a pleased complacency of a child. Then she looked up and announced quite calmly that she'd known all along that Dominic Swain had been Matty's lover. She went further. She said Swain had told her he was making love to Matty on Paul's bed at the very moment he was being killed. He couldn't have told you. He wouldn't. But Barbara Barone stuck to her guns. Swain had thought the whole thing would amuse her. She'd asked him how he could even bear to touch Matty. He said that he kept his mind on the hot bath water and the free meal. Evelyn Matlock had sunk down on one of the chairs, her face in her hands. After a few moments, she looked up at me. He did go out that night. He told me he wanted to talk to Sir Paul. He told me the door was open when he arrived and that they were dead. Both dead. That's what he said. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, well, she killed me, too. Evelyn Matlock began crying. Great sobs that seemed to tear her chest apart. Sarah Barone looked across at me. But surely Dominic couldn't have done it. There wouldn't have been time to commit the murders and clean up afterwards. Not unless he went by car or bicycle, and Halliwell would have seen or heard him. True, if Halliwell had been there, but he wasn't. Halliwell spoke directly to me. He said that Lady Ursula had rung at ten to six, asking for the car. Once inside, she told him to drive to St. Matthew's Church, Paddington. When they arrived, Lady Ursula asked him to park outside the south door. She rang the bell, and Sir Paul answered. She went inside. About half an hour later, she came back to the car and asked Halliwell to join them. That must have been about seven. Sir Paul was there with another man, a tramp. There was a sheet of paper on the table with some lines of handwriting. Sir Paul said he was about to sign his name and wanted Halliwell to witness his signature. Then he signed with his fountain pen, and Halliwell wrote his name underneath. The tramp did the same. When they'd signed, Sir Paul blotted the paper. Then the tramp went out through the door to the right of the fireplace, and Lady Ursula and Halliwell left. So, Mr Halliwell, 
You lied about being in your flat the whole of that evening. I asked him to lie, Chief Inspector. What happened between me and my son in that vestry wasn't relevant to his death. My son was alive when I left him. I asked Halliwell to say nothing about our visit. We'd almost forgotten Barbara Barone. It isn't true. Dominic didn't do it. Can't you see? Matt is jealous because he never really cared for her. How could he? Look at her. And the family have always hated him, him and me. As for you, you never wanted him to marry me. I was never good enough for your precious sons, either of them. Well, this house is mine now, and I think it would be better if you left. You think this house is yours? Allow me to correct you. What my son signed in the vestry that night was his will. You are adequately provided for, but this house, indeed all his property, is left to me, in trust for his unborn son. If that child does not survive, it comes to me. You see, Commander, I went to make sure that my son knew about the child and whether it was his, and to ask what he intended. I said, if she's carrying your child, I want to ensure that he's born safely, and I want to safeguard his future. If you should die tonight, she'll inherit everything, and your child will have Lampart as a stepfather. Is that what you want? Without speaking, he sat down at the table and wrote out the will. Just eight lines. A reasonable income for his wife, and the rest in trust for the child. Lady Ursula, you have lied consistently. You concealed vital information knowing full well that you could be helping your son's butcher go free. But that wouldn't have mattered, would it? Not if your daughter-in-law produced an heir. A legitimate heir, Commander. Miss Matlock, Dominic Swain used the affection you had for him to make you lie for him. That was a betrayal. But what you felt for him, or he for you... That's your own business. He did need me. He never had anyone else. It was love. It was. You once asked me whether I missed a box of matches from the kitchen. Well, I did. He must have taken the box with him when he left. When he arrived that evening, did he go alone into any part of the house? Only to take his toilet bag into the bathroom. That means he could have gone into the study. When he came back, was he carrying anything? Only his evening paper folded over. Could he have been using it to conceal the diary from the study? I suppose so. I believe we're finished here. Before you leave, Commander, I think you should know that a gun is missing from the study safe. It belonged to my elder son. And I think you can assume that Dominic Swain knows the combination of the safe. My son changed it three days before he died. He had the habit of noting the new combination in pencil on the last page of his diary until he was sure that he and I had memorised it. His practice was to circle the digits on next year's calendar. That was the page which I think you showed me, Commander, had been torn out. I had left Father Barnes with thunder rumbling in the distance. He began locking the dark and empty church. He moved into the passage. Behind the grill was a young man, fair-haired, chisel in hand, and the collection box gaped open. If you're looking for the button, my son, you've come too late. The police have found it. No. No, my son. Please! From the moment I walked into the casualty department and saw my grandmother, small and frightened, I knew there was no longer any choice. I said, It's all right, Gran. You're coming home with me. The next day was hectic. It was after six before I was free to set off to the supermarket. I needed enough food to leave ready for the next three days, for I certainly hoped I'd be able to get back to work the following morning. Suddenly the reality of the situation struck me. My gran and I were locked together now until the old lady died. I let myself into the flat and, as always, turned the key in the security lock. The flat seemed unnaturally silent. 
suddenly small facts came together. And even as my hand touched the handle of the closed sitting room door, I knew with absolute certainty that something was wrong. He'd gagged her and tied her to one of the dining chairs with strips of white cloth. He himself stood behind her, eyes blazing, holding the gun with both hands, his arms stretched rigid. As our eyes met, he lowered the gun and placed it against Gran's head. If you want any cooperation from me, take that gag off. I guarantee she'll make no noise. Right, well, come and take it off yourself. But be careful. Gran, not a sound. If you do, he'll put it on again. Promise? Okay. It'll be all right. Now stand over there against the wall. That's right. Why all this panic? You know we've got no real evidence. Ah, but you have. See, this is where my spare button used to be. Pity these buttons are so distinctive. That's what comes from having expensive tastes. How did you find out about that? From the boy who picked it up outside the church, the morning after the murders. Young Darren. I met him. He told me. Where is he? What have you done to him? Nothing. But he told me about the button and where he put it, so all I had to do was get it back. And after that, the boy would be harmless. But a single button? That's not enough to convict you. Look, don't be a fool. Hand over the gun, go home and call your lawyer. I don't think I can do that. Not now. You see, there's this damned officious priest. Or rather, there was. You killed Father Barnes. <laughs> Shot him. So you see, I haven't anything to lose. So what's the plan? I'm getting out. Spain. There's a boat at Chichester Harbour. She belongs to my sister's lover, in case you're interested. You're going to drive me there. Oh, for God's sake, it's the rush hour. It's it easy to risk getting stuck in traffic with every motorist peering into the car. He considered for a moment and then agreed to wait for an hour. I said, look, I've got to ring my boyfriend... He's coming to supper at eight. If he finds the flat empty, he'll know something's wrong. He'll check the car, then he'll ring the yard. I've got to put him off. He was silent, considering. Then he agreed. Alan? It's Kate. Tonight's off. Now, don't ring back. Just come tomorrow if you feel like it. And Alan, remember to bring me that book you promised. The Shakespeare, Love's Labour's Lost, for crying out loud. See you tomorrow. And remember the Shakespeare. That's OK. You'll keep away. He'd better. Now make us something to eat while we wait. Will omelettes do? I've plenty of eggs. Well, get on with it. He ushered us into the kitchen and got Gran onto a chair and bound her in, still pointing the gun at her head. I thought I might as well ask him about the murders. They always want to talk about it. I asked first about Theresa Nolan. I didn't kill her. She killed herself. Because you made her abort your child? Well, she could hardly expect to have it, could she? Anyway, how are you so sure it was mine? If Barone didn't sleep with her, he wanted to. Why else would he have thrown me into the river? Who did he think he was? He was going to leave my sister for his dreary whore. <laughs> or for his god. He humiliated me in front of Diana. Well, he chose the wrong man. Before I left the house that morning, he told Evening where he'd be spending the night. I took his bike, and when I got there, he let me in. Odd that. He knew I was coming. He was expecting me, and he wanted to die. God rot him. He could have tried to stop me, pleaded, argued, please. That's all I wanted from him. The priest could say it, but not Paul Barone. He looked at me with such contempt. I wouldn't have done it, not if he'd have spoken to me. Christ, why didn't he stop me? And Diana Travers, did you kill her too? Oh, I didn't need to. The weeds did it for me. She dived and didn't come up. Damned if I was going to rescue her. She'd laughed at me. I whirled round and flung myself at him. The shot shattered the air. An instant later there was a second explosion and the door of the flat burst open. 
and then I saw AD coming towards me, speaking my name, willing me to keep my eyes on him. Sobbing wildly, I buried my head against AD's jacket. Then I pulled away, fighting for control, and over AD's shoulder I saw Swain, handcuffed, being dragged out. He jerked his head at my gran's body. Well, you're free of her now. Aren't you going to thank me? Aren't you? I'll never know whether I wanted it to happen. Her death, I mean. You heard what Swain called out. Aren't you going to thank me? He knew. Of course you didn't want it to happen, Kate. We all feel partly responsible when we lose someone we love. It's natural guilt, but it isn't rational. You didn't kill your grandmother, Swain did. His final victim. But with murder, there never is a final victim. No one touched by Paul Barone's death will remain unchanged, myself included. Kate knew that perfectly well. But she's tough. She'll learn to bear her personal load of guilt, just as I've learned to carry mine. Yes. Some can gaze and not be sick, but I could never learn the trick. There's this to say for blood and breath. They give a man a taste for death. <laughs>